Good afternoon, everybody. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel discussion. We have an exciting panel discussion for you about disruptions. So this one's titled Supply Chain Disruptions. What's a transportation manager to do next? A little bit of feedback from the mic. Can you take care of that? Good? We good now? I'm, I'm Gary Master, President and COO of Agile Business Media, featuring brands DC Velocity Magazine and CSCMP's Supply Chain Quarterly. I'm pleased to act as a moderator today, and we're so glad you could be with us. We have a star-studded cast here. This, this, this group of individuals here are real thought leaders. So, if you're a Star Wars fan right now, you might be thinking, I sense a disturbance in the force, the supply chain force. Or you may be thinking to go with um, Elon Musk, the supply chain. That's really tricky, and today it really is. But the supply chain disruptions today are no laughing matter to all of us that are right in the middle of them. They're a real challenge. It's difficult, as we all know. We're facing so many different things, um, from war in Ukraine, to a pandemic, to China shutting down again in certain areas, to labor shortages, inflation, and everything else that we've got going on. It impacts every area of the supply chain from planes, from trains, from ports, and yes, even Amazon. I'm pleased to say that we have each one of those areas, planes, trains, and ports, and Amazon, we have a representative from each one here today to talk about the supply chain challenges. Um, before we get started, just a couple of things. I'm gonna ask each one to identify themselves, give us a couple of supply chain trends that they see, We'll go through a series of questions, and those questions are gonna be very, very just cordial conversation between the panelists. And then we're gonna save some time where they're gonna all have like a tidbit or two for you to walk away from this session. And if we have some time left over, we'll open it up for Q&A. Sound fair? Let's get started. Um, like I said, we have real thought leaders here. I had a privilege of being on a phone call with them and the things that they have to offer, I hope that afterwards you'll, you'll be up and just asking all kinds of questions. So let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stacy Watson. I am the Director of Economic Development with the Georgia Ports Authority. Um, I've been with the Georgia Ports Authority since 19... <laughs> Well, since 1992, so I've been there about 30 years. It's hard for me to believe that. So started working as an intern at the Georgia Ports when we were just a small blip on that port radar. Uh, we probably weren't even in the top 10 ports uh, back in the early 90s. And fast forward 30 years, uh, the Georgia Ports Authority is actually the number three uh, container gateway for international trade. First, you've got LA Long Beach, which is one uh, gateway, two different ports. You've got New York, New Jersey. And number three is Savannah. Again, you know, like I, li I like to say, right here in your backyard. So seeing a lot of progress, seeing a lot of, um, of, of transition, what I do on a daily basis um, as Director of Economic Development, I work with all the stakeholders in new business attraction into the state of Georgia. I work with all of Georgia's 159 counties. Um, I work with the Georgia Department of Economic Development, Georgia Power, um, property developers. I work been working a lot lately with uh, private equity to attract new capital investment into the state, as well as new jobs. Uh, uh, if there's anything involved with bringing new jobs, building brick and mortar, I usually get involved. So. Definitely been an interesting time for us. Um, you know, I've got a lot of good things to share that we've done at the Georgia Ports Authority. Um, Port of Savannah right now, I know you've heard of all the backlog of vessels that are happening at a lot of the other ports, the major ports around the country, larger ports and even smaller ports. We've done some innovative things around the state and around the southeast to bring down our backlog. I mean, we were three, four months ago, we were up to 25 to 30 ships at anchor waiting to get into the port. 
You know, there was this meme on uh, Facebook or on LinkedIn where, you know, people were swimming out to the ocean to get their Christmas presents. Well, you don't have to do that in Savannah anymore. We're, we're working vessels. Um, as of yesterday, there were two vessels at anchor, but that's about normal for us, for ships getting in and out. So very efficient port, um, single terminal concept. We've got one major port in Garden City, Georgia, that's 1,345 acres. And if you look at LA Long Beach, the number of separate terminals that they have around the San Pedro Basin, that's about 13 different ports. Even New York, New Jersey, um, six different terminals. So by us being a single terminal, we're, the, we're, the, we're a common carrier uh, terminal, which means that we're, we're involved in the day-to-day -day functions of operating our facility. Lots of um, productivity, lots of efficiency with using the Port of Savannah that I hope to express to everybody today. Hi everyone, I am Elliot Page. I am the Director of Air Service Development at Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Um, air Service Development simply means business development. I work on both the passenger side as well as the cargo side. So I work on in terms of getting a lot of you here uh, from international cities. Um, we, we are connected to about 70 international cities over 150 domestic cities. So basically, it doesn't matter whether you're going to heaven or hell, you have to come to Atlanta. <laughs> right. um, although I work on both passenger and cargo, um, you know, they always say that uh, cargo doesn't tweet, passengers tweet, passengers complain to their, to their politicians. So I love the, the quietness of cargo. <laughs> So I, I love cargo so much so that um, at the airport they call me the cargo man. And they think of me as some hero of cargo with a cape, although capes are not good on airports, as you well know. So um, in terms of what's happening at the airport, in terms of a trend, uh, there's a big trend that's caused by all of you, I think. <laughs> Every one of you, uh, because we've been locked down because of the because of COVID, uh, and this was happening even before COVID. Uh, brick and mortar stores were uh, decreasing in usage. We preferred to order stuff online, and uh, as consumers now, where we want things customized, we want we're getting smaller packages. We want a specific color, a specific design, a specific size of goods and the market is is providing that and you have companies like amazon is making sure that it gets to us but for for that to happen we at the airport have to be super efficient we have to make sure we have the right warehouses right staffing uh all the right facilities and entire logistics to to make sure that your products get to you on time uh, as expected so um for us it's a challenge because now we've seen a tremendous increase in what was normally maybe 10, 20 percent growth in e-commerce. Uh, we've seen that five year, maybe 10 years growth in the last two years. So it, it, that, that demand, that quick demand has put a lot of pressure on us, but we still have to, to make sure that we put all the right facilities in place. So during the discussion, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we've put in place, both short-term, medium, and long-term, uh, because we, we have a lot of cargo at the airport. Uh, when these guys have a strike or uh, any kind of disruption, believe it or not, the ocean freight impacts us. And all the disruption from everyone getting sick in factories and supply chains breaking down and shortage of uh, inputs, intermediary goods for manufacturing, all of that has an impact on us because we service this region, all of the manufacturing sectors in this region. So hopefully I can talk to you about some of that and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jim Ruiz, and I'm a director with Amazon Freight. Amazon Freight is a service that lets any shipper plug into Amazon's transportation network for their own shipments. So for example, our customers in the EU and North America, they use the same truckload intermodal and less than truckload capacity that Amazon uses on its shipments. 
Uh, I lead the North American operations and sales teams for Amazon Freight. So what we're seeing right now, uh, I think a lot of you in the industry are seeing as well, is we're seeing uh, volatile and rising freight rates, driver and capacity shortages. We're seeing congestion at nodes and that congestion working its way through the supply chain. Uh, and now we're seeing volatile fuel prices. But despite all of this, uh, our Amazon customers, and I hope many if not all of you are Amazon customers, they expect us to deliver on time, to be safe, and to be cost effective. And so every day at Amazon there are teams that are working very hard on delivering on this customer promise. So the way that Amazon Freight does this is that we add volume density to Amazon's network through bringing on external shippers. So these could be uh, vendors or FBA sellers that are shipping into in inbound uh, into Amazon. But this could also be any shipper that's shipping to their customers or to their own uh, warehouses. This volume density helps us reduce, uh, uh, helps us increase our trailer capacity, which means we have to use fewer trucks and it lowers our cost and we're able to pass that savings on to our customer. So I really look forward to this panel and hearing what uh, all you all are doing as well. Um, and I'll be taking notes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is DeAndre Larry. I'm the Group Vice President of International Intermodal for Norfolk Southern. Thank you, Gary, for the opportunity to be part of the panel and fellow, fellow panelists. And I've got a lot of customers in the audience, too. Thank you for your business. Uh, we appreciate your freight. Norfolk Southern and railroads historically have done three things. If you think about, I think about it in terms of my children, Thomas the Tank Engine. There's three things we move historically. We move energy, that's coal, crude oil, feedstocks that go into exploration, that's energy. The second thing we move is grain, historically. The third thing we move is industrial products. That's all the steel, all the lumber, all of the, sort of the feedstocks that might go into your house. The fourth thing we've begun, began to move over the last couple of decades is what's called intermodal. Intermodal is a trailer or a container on a flat car that we move. If you ask any railroad executive uh, or board member uh, for the last 20 years and probably for the next 20 years, the growth engine of the rail industry will be intermodal. Uh, those other commodity segments, those three that I told you before, really move with GDP. So our shareholders and frankly the market wants us to be a larger player in the intermodal space. We do two things in intermodal. We move domestic freight, and, and Jim falls in both these categories. That's why we love Amazon so much. We move domestic freight, containers that go between cities. Uh, we also move international freight. That's the business I look after, my team and I look after. We move containers that come off ships at Stacy's Port, inland to places like Atlanta, Austell, and then from there they fan, fan out to the distribution network across the U.S. What we're seeing is our customers in the marketplace are demanding optionality. They're saying that in the past, I may have brought that container in to Savannah, moved it to rail inland. Well, now I want the option to transload it in Savannah. Now I may want the option to uh, do something different and provide an L LCL product out of Savannah. And we're being asked to provide those solutions with our partners. And so the largest trend we're seeing is because we're all, we've all been at home for two years and all of the logistics professionals that are in this conference and around the world have had time to figure out how we're moving and how we want to absorb things for the last couple of years, people are realizing that they don't want just redundancy, they want optionality. They want to be able to pick and choose an all of the above strategy. And so as a railroad, that's unique for us because again, for the, since J.P. Morgan and the others founded us over 100 years ago, we've been used to something that's very rateable and easy to replicate each year. Now we're being asked to maybe be a supply chain solutions provider, maybe be a real estate developer, maybe be a business development entrepreneur, so to speak, and we're ready for that, and we want to do more of that, and, and we'll talk about this more on the panel of how we see the market driving us and each other towards a different future that looks a lot like it is today, but is different in a lot of ways. Thanks, that's great. Um, going with the, uh, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of feedback still in this. Um, going along with the theme that you talked about, volatility. 2022 looks to continue to be volatile. What are each of your companies doing for the volatility and how to handle it? You talked about two years, we're kind of sitting around doing things, right? Trying to figure it out. What are you all doing? And what does that mean for some of the shippers in the room here? 
Yeah, I'll start. I think it's a couple of things. I kind of think about it in terms of what are we doing with our customers, what are we doing internally, and sort of what are we doing with our other stakeholders. With our customers, first and foremost, we have to expand our avenues of communication. So in the past, my relationship would be sort of binary. I would talk to a steamship or someone in my seat would talk to the steamship lines. Well, now we're finding that there's a lot of utility in talking to more of the chassis providers. There's a lot of utility in talking to the drayage community because people are flexing in and out of the drayage community and that impacts us. There's a lot of utility in talking to warehouse people and understand how their development plans kind of mesh with our development plans. And then talking to our customers to understand, hey, in this crazy world, what do you see it looking like over the next year, two years, and how do we plan for that? How do we talk inside of our organization? Again, what we've learned over the last couple of years, we learned a lot, lot, a lot of things over the last couple of years. But one thing we've learned, I think everyone at home and in our professional community is, you might want to expect the unexpected. You might want to challenge the perspective that yesterday is coming back, because it may not come back. And so how do we implement that in our forecasting process? How do we implement that into our asset planning process? You know, as an example, we rateably could count on two trains a day coming out of Stacy's Port every day. Well, we, we've heard from our customers it could be four trains a day. We've heard from our customers it could be four trains a day, but different types of trains going to different places. How do you plan for that? How do you hire for that? How do you think for that? The last group is with our stakeholders. You know, again, I talked about chassis providers and groups like that, but with our regulators. You know, we, we had a conversation going with our regulators that looked at our technology spins, looked at our sort of space in one way, but now with all the changes that are coming, how do, how do we have a constructive dialogue with our regulators to make sure that they understand sort of the hand that we're looking at? How do we have active and, and thoughtful dialogue with our state and local governments to help them understand sort of what we're seeing and some of the things we need to, to be successful. And then our port partners. We think they're attached at the hip with us. And so how do we think differently about infrastructure? Stacey will probably talk about some of the infrastructure that they've built, but our capital plans have to include the ports because they are us. And so we've, we've, ha we've learned that we have to be more uh, purposeful and strategic with all of our conversations with our stakeholders. Oh. I can, let, let, I can, let me build on what DeAndre said there. So uh, just building on the, the customer aspect to it. So it, Amazon is a customer obsessed company and we work backwards from our customers. And so our inbound shippers and our external shippers, they expect us to keep their operations fluid, control cost, and be a safe and reliable source of capacity. And so many years ago, Amazon recognized that the third party truckload carriers that we use we're not going to be able to scale with what Amazon uh, and our inbound and external shippers needed. So we invested in 33,000 trailers and intermodal containers throughout North America. And so what these trailers allow us to do is it not only helps us keep our customers fluid, but when you add this equipment with uh, Amazon's uh, network density and the technology that we bring to Planet, we're able to lower costs and lower carbon intensity, which is good for our customers. So uh, really, you know, to, to, to really, you know, plus one to DeAndre's point. It's the customers that are really driving us to do things we need to do. Yep, and if I could add to that as well, um, DeAndre, you are perfect in your response as far as, as infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that we have invested in and we'll continue to invest in is infrastructure. Our direct customers are the ocean carriers, the railroads, and the trucking companies. We provide the facility that makes logistics work on the international side. So we're investing about four and a half billion dollars over the next 12 years to add capacity, to add velocity to our facilities, to add efficiency. Um, capacity is an issue. Pre-COVID, sitting on our terminal at any time of the day, a snapshot of the number of containers would have been 40 to 45,000, okay? And I would have told you pre-COVID that we like to maintain a gap of about 20% between our actual throughput and our capacity. Well, guess what we grew last year? 20.1%. And that is a, a challenge. You know, when you start getting too many containers on a terminal, your efficiency goes down. Basically, there's gridlock. Too many trucks, too many containers. The traffic can't move as it should. So we've um, undertaken, and uh, I don't want to say um, 
uh, an aggressive um, expansion campaign, but it is fairly aggressive. We've moved several of our capacity adding uh, projects to the left. So there were green spaces on our terminal that we master plan that we're going to add capacity. There is the rail, uh, the, the Mason Intermodal Rail Facility that services both CSX and Norfolk Southern. You'll be able, we will be able to build two mile long trains on our facility to go to Chicago, to go out to Memphis, to come up to Atlanta, and again, increasing our capacity, increasing that throughput. One thing that we've seen over the last year is the dwell times for containers, pre-COVID, post-COVID. Pre-COVID, it was about four days for a truck box, okay? Right now, 10 to 11 days on average, and that's not good for a port to be effective and efficient, we've got to move freight. We are not built to store freight. So using the rail is an important part of our future going, you know, going forward. We actually do about 20% of our business in and out via rail. We hope to get that number up to about 30%. Dwell time for a rail box, we're looking at 36 hours versus seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days. So that rail network and our connectivity to rail is very important for us. We've actually set up a network of inland ports, which is direct rail service from the Garden City Terminal, from our port, to those areas around the state of Georgia that have a demand for our freight. We've got one that's operational that's up in northwest Georgia, a little town called Crandall, so that you know companies up in middle Tennessee, up in northeast Alabama, even northwest Georgia, they can utilize our port. They can pick up and drop off in Crandall versus driving to Savannah to pick up and drop off and then driving back to that area of the state. It's worked out very well for us. Uh, the capacity of that facility is somewhere around 30,000 containers on an annual basis. We're right at 30, and it opened in 2018. We've got plans to build a second um, inland port in Hall County in Gainesville, Georgia, and eventually a third in um, West Georgia, West Central Georgia. So again, just adding capacity, accelerating a lot of those plans that were actually going to take us out seven, eight, nine years, we're going, to excel, we're going to expedite those to the next three to four years. We're going to increase capacity. Right now, the capacity of our facility is about six and a half to seven million TEUs on an annual basis. We're going to take the capacity of the Garden City Terminal over the next five to six years up to nine million TEUs. And today, we're handling about 5.6 million on an annual basis. So. The takeaway from our side as far as the volatility and some of the things that we're doing in Savannah, again, just adding capacity, adding the ability to move more containers. Well, in the airport's case, I think we've had lots of practice of uh, disruptions. You know, every time there is a, 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 an issue with a port facility or uh, anything like that, we have a surge in demand for air service on our airport, for cargo. So we've had lots of practice, and we've had a long-term plan, which we've continued to implement. Um, so you really look at it in terms of short to medium term and long term. In the short to medium term, you know, a lot of it is based on relationships. Um, we spend a lot of time communicating, talking to our Customs and Border Protection uh, colleagues, or TSA colleagues. In fact, I'm, I'm missing a meeting right now, but my colleagues are at a meeting with Customs to talk about some of the challenges we're having on the airport in terms of clearing international goods right now. So, you know, we, we're constantly talking to all the stakeholders, to the, the ground handlers, trying to solve problems um, as they occur. Because, you know, you, you can't predict everything. Um, and with air, air cargo, it has to move fast. You have to find solutions pretty quickly for it to get off, uh, get in the air. So relationships are important. We, you know, it, despite being an airport, we have road congestion issues. So we have a lot of trucks that come to the airport, um, sometimes, you know, 30,000 trucks per month. And um, what we realized that we needed to find a way for the trucks not to uh, aggregate themselves in front of the warehouses, but to, to park someplace else so that we can have f less congestion. 
So we developed a, a system, we, we built a parking lot, and we developed a system where the truckers would get a, a, a signal, a message on their cell phone, an SMS message that tells them where to go, what doctor to go to, what time to go there, so that they can, they can um, not congest that area. So that's been working so far. We've improved on it by having uh, implemented what we call a cargo community system. Uh, first in the region, in, in the U.S., to implement this system, and now lots of airports across North America have implemented this. Basically, if you think of it in terms of how you track and trace your orders from, from Amazon, you, you can, you, Amazon is a closed-loop system where it tells you where your cargo is at any time of the day or night. In our case, you know, typically the airlines would not speak to the freight forwarders uh, or to the ground handlers or to the trucking company or to the airlines ab about a specific cargo. Now we have a platform for that to happen. Um, so that, that platform is up and running. Um, we need more people to sign on. It, it's, it's interesting because um, technology is such, and I guess we'll talk about this later on, uh, is something that sometimes some people fear. But, uh, but, it, but it's, it's, it's ongoing, and it's, um, it's creating great efficiencies for us. We've reduced truck wait times from three, four hours to sometimes 35, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, one of the long-term plans that we have, uh, recently we just opened a new warehouse where, because of all e-commerce business that we're getting, DHL has added uh, a new facility that they're totally mechanizing. It's basically... Uh, a giant robot of a warehouse that's going to be one of the, the hubs for moving uh, their small packages in this area. So Amazon, uh, <laughs> there's competition. Um, we have Amazon as well. It has two, two flights per day to, with us. Um, they're looking to increase service, and we're trying to find ways to accommodate them. Um, we have WFS, uh, World Flight Services, which is a new ground handler, which started last year. So we're expanding our capacity. Uh, the latest thing that we have is um, an RFP that's out right now. Uh, for those of you who are interested, it's still open. It's an RFP for the, the development of 53 acres of uh, green field uh, to turn that basically into a cargo, air cargo city. Um, we expect to have about uh, eight to ten parking spots for aircrafts and, I don't know, hundreds of parking spots for, for trucks. So, um, and we want it to be state-of-the-art, modern facility that can handle pharmaceuticals, that can handle uh, e-commerce, handle any, just about any cargo, air cargo-reliant industry. Um, we, we're aiming to be competitive in the long run. Right now, we know that we are at capacity, and in order for us to grow, we have to add more capacity. We have to add more technology to increase the efficiencies so that um, you know, we can serve our community better. Thanks for that, guys. That was, that was really helpful. I'm, I'm going to change it up a little bit on our conversation here because you're all talking about adding capacity. And if you look around at this show, right, it's well attended, right? I mean, it's busy. Our economy is busy. How many of you have a labor shortage that, that if you go out to eat in your company, how many have experienced a labor shortage? So raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, I'll, we'll talk to you later. You can tell us what's going on. But we've got a labor shortage and we got inflation. We got prices going out of control. And you all are wrestling with adding capacity. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in your company with inflation, with a labor shortage. You can, you can deal with either one of them, but tell me about that. Well, I'll, I'll start out a little bit and talk to you a little bit about workforce. Um, as an economic developer and as a port employee, if you ask me the one single thing that would keep Stacy up at night, it is um, workforce not necessarily workforce on the port and on the terminal, even though it is a concern for us, but workforce for our customers and our customers' customers. Workforce in the distribution centers and the warehouses outside the terminal gates. And the only good thing, if there is a good thing, as far as, on the, as, as the competitiveness, is that we're seeing it you know, around the country. We're seeing it in every port city. So how do we address that? So we're trying to take the lead 
in the Savannah area, um, you know, what we did is we, we got a, a, a workforce consultant and um, we did a study strictly based on supply chain, logistics, jobs, employment, outlook in the Savannah region. So what we wanted to do is identify areas that we may have been overlooking and get a real story of the workforce conditions in our area. We had different people saying different things about our workforce. We had our competition saying different things. So what was that real story? So what we did is we broke that down into short-term, long-term uh, issues that we can address. So we're working with the University of Georgia right now. It is a collaborative effort. We brought in partners. We didn't want to make it too big because it, it, didn't, it becomes difficult to manage. So we're working with the University of Georgia. We're working with the, the technical college system. We're working with the Savannah-Chatham County public school system. And that is a great example, getting new kids, getting young kids that are not necessarily college bound, getting them interested in logistics. You know, working in a warehouse, providing a career path, a path forward, because as an industry, I don't think we've done a good job with educating our young people about the advantages, about the benefits, and about logistics on the hourly side as a career path. Um, so working with the school system to do, to do that, working with the parents of children, uh, working on uh, marginalized um, individuals uh, that may be able to get back into the workforce, working on military. You know, in the Savannah area, we have Fort Stewart, so we have quite a few military uh, retirees and just soldiers that are getting out of the military that want to stay in the area. And, Fortunately, port cities, most port cities, especially on the East Coast, are destination um, uh, areas for people to want to live because of the quality of life. So Savannah has positive net in migration. So how do we tap into that? So we've just started on in the initial stages of identifying in those areas that we're going to put a little bit of work into. So keep your eyes and ears open because we're going to have a huge recruiting effort to get young people, to get military into the Savannah area and working in those warehouses and those distribution centers. That's great, thanks. I can, I can, let me take a different angle on this one. So uh, the, the labor challenges that we're seeing in the industry, they impact our selling partners and their warehouses, as well as the carriers we use and the drivers. And so one of the things that we recognized we had to raise the bar on is how efficient our operations were for those partners. So a good example is with the trailers that we own, we're able to do most of the Amazon network as drop and hook freight for drivers. Drivers love this because it gets them in and out of our facilities very fast. Another example is uh, the investment we're making in technology for visibility and also to detect and, and resolve disruptions before they result in delays for our selling partners or our drivers. So I think both of these are two really great examples at how we are really striving to be a, a much better, uh, more efficient partner um, for the, the stakeholders that rely on us. You know, at, at the airport, we, um we also have staff issues, especially on the air cargo side. Um, we do have it on the passenger side as well, and it's always strange to see baggage agents coming upstairs to actually help passengers board their flights because we just don't have enough, enough folks. Um, and at the airport is, is, is special as well because you need, to be, you need to be badged. You need to be approved by, and fingerprinted, you need to be approved by the FBI in order to work on the airport. So it's, it's always challenging to get good staff that you, know, you can ensure that they can pass all the requirements to get a badge. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking to universities, talking to high schools. Uh, last week, Friday, I, I was speaking, uh, me and my colleagues, we had a group of students from Auburn University. We took them, we spoke to them about different aspects of, of the work that we do. We took them on the ramp, showed them the aircrafts and the cargo and so forth. So very exciting stuff because not many people get to get that close to an aircraft and get that, that close to the operations. And you know, we, we encourage them to <laughs> apply to us when they're ready, when they're ready to get a job. Um, and we, we do a lot of those with a variety of universities across the region. 
Um, we, we do it with high schools. We spend a lot of time with the high schools talking to them about all the different careers that are possible on, on the airport. It's, I think many, for many of us, we kind of fall into this, this industry. Um, very few of us, when we were at you know, high school age, knew that you could be a biologist working on an airport, uh, you know, dealing with bird strikes, for instance. You know, we don't, we don't know these things, but it's incumbent upon us as the career experts to help to build a future labor force by kind of marketing the work that we do. It's exciting work, and we need to make it, you know, show that to the younger generation. We also have a lot of uh, job fairs just to try to, to, to fill the short-term gaps and attract people looking, looking at the market, seeing where there, there, there needs to fill certain gaps. Uh, but we, you know, and if I talk to my cargo ground handlers, they're always short-staffed. They never have enough people. Um, Amazon never have enough people. So it's, you know, we're always trying to find ways to, to help them both in the short-term, but also looking at a long-term horizon. Yeah, we share the same uh, illness that I think the entire market shares of a lack of labor or a shortage of it. I'll, I'll touch at it from, from two perspectives. As a railroad, Velocity, like most of you, is our friend. The more productive we can be, the less labor we need per unit. And so we have a laser focus on not just moving trains faster, but moving bit larger trains and doing things like that. I'll touch on something on the railroad we're doing and then something at our terminals. On the railroad, we've got technology that we had to overlay as an industry on our railroad over the last five years called positive train control. And that was basically a safety overlay that allowed our trains to never run into each other. What we discovered was we could put cameras on those same trains and give ourselves the ability to inspect our tracks. And so we're working with our regulator to implement that technology as an add-on on top of that safety system because we think, we know as a railroad, we lose time when we have to have a physical me or you go out and inspect that track. And some things that we'll miss, uh, a, a sharp camera can catch on. And so that time that we take the train, the train line out of service to inspect it, we can now leave it in service while the train, while it's running over with each of our all of your freight, inspects the track, notifies us here in Atlanta we got an issue, we send somebody out to fix it. That's less labor, that's more productivity on that track, uh, all the things that we hope for. The second thing at our terminals, if, you, if I think about it from the standpoint of, I think of it as when I check into the airport parking. Same thing happens when you come into a rail terminal to drop off your container. Someone looks at your license plate, literally a person looks at your license plate, then you go park it, a person checks to make sure you're parked where you should be parked. You catch on pretty quickly. All that's something that technology can solve for. So that future proofs our labor situation because now those employees that we had checking the license plate, checking the parking, we can train them to do other jobs that are probably higher value inside that terminal. That gives them an opportunity to earn a better living, a higher living. That gives us an opportunity to have a candidate pool for jobs that we're short staffed on today. And so we're, we're looking at that with our labor, with our contractors that run our terminals to say, how do we have less people per, per unit handled? And how do we sort of up educate those people to do jobs that are of higher value so that when we do have a labor shortage, you know, we don't, we hit that inflection point later versus what we do today. And one, one thing I neglected to mention, something that specifically we're doing as a port, um, working with the school systems with Bryan County, um, um, Chatham County, Liberty County, the local school systems in the Savannah area. And we started what's called the YES program. And it's, it's, it's yes, because it means youth learning, equipment, and safety. We have to invest in our youth. So we get the principal, the superintendent, the leadership of all these school systems, and they identify six or seven kids. And we take them through an interview process, not necessarily, again, college-bound, but have a great aptitude for on, the, on the mechanical side. They make great um, equipment operators. So we start them in our trucks, okay? We start them, we give them a mentor, and that mentor follows them for the first year, year and a half of their career, of the beginning of their career. And we've actually, we actually started this program about three years ago, and one of the 
uh, participants in the first uh, class is now operating a ship to shore crane. Something that would take a normal person, I would say, a decade to get the aptitude, to build up the experience, to get up in a ship to shore crane. This high school kid is doing it today. And um, our executive director, Griff Lynch, asked him, he's like, well, you've already reached, you know, ship to shore crane status. What, what are you going to do now? And, and the kid said, he says, Griff, I want your job. So those are the kind of young people that you get, and that's the kind of investment that you get. That's the kind of return that you get when you invest in the youth. So, You know, thanks for that discussion. Um, I think we have the makings of a panel here that could lead the industry charge for bringing people into the supply chain. What do you guys think? That's pretty impressive. Um, we'll have to talk about that afterwards if you're interested. Um, so as we, as we go through our time here, I see where time's starting to run down. I want to do something. We talked about, I want to have some tidbits for people here. I, I think I want to go into that now, and I want you to think about, we've got some shippers in the room here. We've got some folks that make product, that need stuff delivered to them for their manufacturing of product. What are some things that you could tell them, some advice? that they should be thinking about right now and all this volatility and all this lack of labor and all this inflation, what's just a point or two that you could give them? Or three. I mean, maybe I'll start. Um, <laughs> I'll roll it off. You know, um, uh, I think last week, uh, someone brought a student uh, from some university to, to have a conversation with me and they, they, they're doing uh, aviation management, airport management or something like that. And, um, you know, I told them one of the most important things in is airport service, uh, the people. Uh, whether it's your staff or the passengers or in, in our case of cargo, the business people, uh, the people who are working to, to move the goods, uh, the people, they're the most important. If you solve everything else, you solve the people problem. And, you know, I think of uh, a ground handler who once told me, so in, in Atlanta, Atlanta is also called Hot Atlanta. And I know some of you know that. It's hot here in the summer. It's like an oven. And um, so it's also like an oven on the tarmac. Imagine moving cargo, driving a forklift, driving a tug on, on the ramp in, you know, 90, close to 100 degrees, you know, Fahrenheit. Um, that's tough. So what this ground handler does is, is in the spring, he hires more staff than he needs because he knows that, you know, in the summer when the heat hits, most people will, will just quit. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll go out there and it doesn't matter how much ice cream he gives them, it doesn't matter how much Gatorade, water, whatever, they'll, they'll quit. They'll quit in 30 minutes of, of feeling, you know, 110 degrees. And you know, I said, well, we have the technology. If you walk around this, this hall, you'll see there's some equipment that has air-conditioned tugs and forklifts. Uh, there are air-conditioned vents, um, curtain wall, uh, wind walls for warehouses. There's technology to make it more comfortable for staff to work, a little bit more comfortable to work on the ramp um, or to work in the warehouses. And, you know, we need to invest in this, this technology uh, because especially now when labor is so short, we need to treat our people well. I don't know, when you go to restaurants these days, we always, I always tell my friends, make sure you treat the waiters well because if they quit, we won't be able to go to restaurants. All right, um, the people are fundamentally important. So I, I, I think that's my first, my first takeaway. The second one is technology. Um, you know, we're, we're a tech-savvy group of generation now. We love our cell phones. We do everything in our computers. Um, but in the cargo business, we're terrified of technology. I don't get it. Um, we still love paper. We still love our AOA bills and our stacks of paper. Not, not you, Amazon. <laughs> and, and it, you know, it's, it's tough to see that your consumers are expecting speed and efficiency using the technology that's available. And we ourselves in the industry are still 
kind of hesitant. We still like the old ways of doing things, especially in the freight forwarding in this uh, sector. So it, all of us, you know, as consumers, as people in the industry ourselves, should be the evangelists for using more technology for being more efficient, not just for the sake of, of being tech savvy, but for efficiency, for reducing costs. Uh, when I, I mentioned the cargo community system earlier, you can pay for your all the fees in that platform. It's a payment platform as well. You can book uh, slot, slots at a warehouse. Uh, so it's a reservation system. You can uh, coordinate your inventory in the warehouse. So it's an inventory management system. It can integrate all of these things uh, to make you more efficient. And I don't know, this is where we need to go. So I think all of us should be the evangelists for you know, treating people well and using the technology that consumers expect us to use. Yeah, I can build on it, that, those are great. Um, so I won't repeat those, uh, but people in tech, uh, near and dear to our heart at, at Amazon. I, I, would, uh, I would have three. Um, first one is just on asset utilization. So we spend a lot of time figuring out uh, how we increase our network density with either an inbound shipment or an external shipper shipment to increase the, the, the cube utilization of our trailers. And so what that does, it lowers our unit cost, but it also means that we need to use fewer drivers and fewer moves. And so the lowest cost truck move is the one you don't have to move, right? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that and capacity utilization. Uh, the second area would be on um, uh, just clever or different ways of engaging with capacity. So I mentioned uh, what we do with our operations to make them driver friendly. So that increases the velocity of drivers coming in and out of facilities, which means they can do more and earn more, which is great for the drivers. Another uh, program that we do is something called Amazon Freight Partners. And so this is a new program where entrepreneurs can start a trucking business uh, and grow it alongside Amazon. Uh, so Amazon uh, funds the equipment and we maintain the equipment for them. We provide them exclusive training and then we give them uh, long-term growth prospects. Uh, we help these entrepreneurs recruit drivers from the local community. We do that through uh, websites or even advertising that Amazon pays for. And then operating in the Amazon network it's a better driver experience because there's more home time and they're in and out of our facilities. And so better driver experience uh, improves driver retention and improved driver, driver retention is really great for these entrepreneurs. And I think the third one is just collaborating with uh, supply chain partners. So you know, at, at Amazon, we're very customer obsessed. And so we view our selling partners, our carriers, and the drivers that haul our equipment as customers. And so a result of this culture, we've over many years have built strong collaborative relationships with these, uh, with these partners. And we, frankly, we really had to lean into that over the last two years given the volatility in the, um, in, in the industry. So I guess the tip would be to, um, you know, if you, if you haven't already, start collaborations with your supply chain partners, and if you have, lean into them. And you know, I've been in the industry for a little bit over 25 years, and my opinion is like the best, these collaborations are what drive resiliency, they drive innovation and invention, and frankly, sometimes it's what's needed to get freight off the dock, which is important. And you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't do a plug for Amazon Freight. If you want to, Amazon Freight is the easiest way to collaborate with Amazon on uh, transportation. And so uh, happy to chat with anyone, or you can go to our website at freight.amazon.com. Yeah, two things, and kind of piggybacking on what Jim said. The first is optionality. Embrace it, it's here to stay. Our customers, our customers, your customers are in their supply chain saying, I can't do this again. I can't be under understocked. I can't have uh, product running off shelves, so I'm going to do what I can to build that optionality or resilience to, to not have that happen again. The second thing is challenging norms. So think about who I am. I represent a 150-year-old industry uh, that for over 120 years of that really was born on the backs of coal, grain, and industrial products. Those things, to a lesser degree, will be there for us over time. So we've got a challenge to Norma who will be in the future. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One problem we faced 
at our rail terminals was when a trucker drops off a container to take back to Stacy's port or other ports, 85% of the time they leave empty. And so we could stand there and say, well, we'll just wait for dri the drivers to catch up. We'll just wait for the hiring to catch up. We'll just wait for the tomorrow to come back. So we'll have enough drivers to do that. Challenge and norms. You hire bright, talented people. I've got a, a, a person on my team, I was going to say young lady, but a person on my team, Jordan Masters, that's here, that when we sat down and talked about that problem, helped come up with a solution that said, why don't we incent truckers who are dropping off stuff to pick up stuff? Because when we talked to the truckers, they said they're working off two different work orders. Well, in Chicago, we could eradicate 45,000 metric tons of carbon if we got to just 50 percent of that happening. In Chicago, we could get to having 1,000 extra truckers a week created out of thin air just by us challenging the norm that we'll wait. Truckers will hire enough people over time. Or we could say we don't wait. We challenge those perspectives and we introduce programs that help force multiply. They help force to multiply the drivers that are out there because guess what? Those drivers that are hiring people, they're hiring our conductors. <laughs> they're hiring Amazon's warehouse people. They're hiring you know, other folks that are in supply chain. So if we can find a way to challenge norms to create capacity out of thin air, I think that'll, we, we've seen that through the collaboration, um, we'll, be, we'll create that optionality and resilience that, that we need. So I'll leave those two with you, optionality and challenging norms. Uh, I tend to agree with you, um, DeAndre. We definitely see an opportunity uh, for what we call matchbacks on the international side, uh, developing container yards, so setting up those facilities in those areas that an import load can go into and that ocean carrier has to agree to allow that empty container to be loaded with an export load and go back to the port, does two things for us. Eliminates two gate moves and it creates opportunities for jobs and opportunities for investments outside of our terminals. Okay, that's one is that creation of those container yards for those matchbacks that we've taken an initiative to look into different parts of the state to see where those um, areas of opportunity might be. Also looking into utilizing IPI a bit more. Uh, ocean carriers right now don't want to pick on them, but they're doing well. They want to get those empty containers back on the port, back out to Asia, so that they can stuff it with freight. And and you know they're making what 20 grand uh, uh, per voyage on the inbound side, but they might be making two grand a voyage for the outbound. So they're taking empty containers back to Asia as fast as possible. So. One of the things that we look to do and we hope to accomplish uh, with the ocean carriers utilizing our inland port network is having those ocean carriers um, offer a bill of lading to the Northeast Georgia Terminal, offer it to um, uh, the future Gainesville facility, offer inland point uh, bills of lading to Memphis, to Chicago. They're a bit reluctant to do that, but you're the customer you can actually request those uh, services from the ocean care. And if enough customers make those requests, then they will start listening. So again, um, optionality, versatility, and just working with the ocean carrier, working with the ports, and uh, probably the most thing, just have, have a little patience. Have a little patience. Thank you, gentlemen, for a great discussion. Um, can we have a hand for our panelists? I'm going to open it up for questions, but a hand for these, these individuals here. Great thought leaders. We've got a couple of minutes. Some, could we take some questions? Yes. My question's for DeAndre with Norfolk Southern. Uh, I believe a few months ago, Norfolk Southern opened up a, a matchback incentive program at, at a few of your rail yards. Um, and I think that was on a pilot program at a few different terminals. How has that been going, and do you see that that could be increasing to other rail terminals across the country? Yeah, that's the program I was mentioning. Jordan Masters, who's sitting two rows in front of you, is the, she's the author of it and brainchild. Um, it was her brainchild. Uh, yeah, we're, we saw positive results. Uh, a couple of stats. The folks that participated, the truckers that participated, had a higher matchback percentage than those that didn't. 
We've just rolled it out to Charleston because, again, we feel we could wait for the market to catch up in Charleston. At, at Charleston, it comes off dock, trucks over to our rail terminal, and then we put it on a train. So we're very dependent on truck. Uh, we, we've introduced it in Charleston because we can wait for the market to heal and have enough truckers or we can incent it. And so we think April, starting April 1st, we're going to see an improvement there in the utility and the number of truckers that leave our terminal with a box that brought a box there. Uh, we want to change the industry with it. You know, when I, when I say this, when I speak on other panels, when I talk to my colleagues across the industry, I said this is a fundamental issue that we have as an industry that when you come into a rail terminal, we're expecting more truckers to show up. Let's figure out how to help the truck community become sort of force multiplied and we can, we can help this. And once it gets the discipline in place, the market will have changed and, and we can step into, you know, moving more volume just naturally. Thanks for the question. Can we have one more question? We have time for one more question. Anybody with a question? Thank you. Uh, so my question is for Stacy. Um, honestly, uh, you know, being in a company that we ship globally, uh, I see, you know, ports like LAX and then also the New York Global Terminal, right, getting congested. Um, and us trying to identify other ports that we can utilize, right, to get our freight and move it. Uh, are you seeing that, you know, since, you know, this has happened as far as congestion at these other major ports, that you're receiving a higher profit margin, right, from people starting to utilize the Savannah port instead of these other ones? Um, great question. As far as our profits go, um, yes, I would say we're more profitable now because we're moving more volume. Not because we're charging more, um, not because we're adding additional fees on top of other fees that we would have um, that we would have charged pre-COVID, but Yes, I mean, we are in the business to make money. We operate as a private, you know, we're quasi-government, quasi-private. We do operate for a profit, but every profit that we make, every penny of the profit that we make is reinvested back into our facilities statewide. So that is then compounding that benefit and that advantage that we're giving to you as a shipper, that we're giving to the ocean carriers, the rail, and all of our stakeholders. So yeah, there is competition between every port around the country for freight. Um, our biggest competition actually would be the West Coast. We're trying to convert as much freight, you know, Trans-Pacific to uh, uh, say Shanghai through the Panama Canal, hit Savannah and go west. So we've got a lot of different um, uh, programs on our port. Uh, we just um, uh, completed our Mason Intermodal Facility with the inland port concept that we just talked about, um, uh, definitely increasing that uh, throughput of rail on our side. But, but yes, we are seeing, to answer your question, yes, we are seeing more profits, but that gives us the ability to invest more into our facilities to make it a better port for you to utilize. We are out of time. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for being here. And thank you again to our panelists.